talking about Jephthah today, and the passage we're going to look at is one of those passages of scripture that is kind of difficult to read through because of the content that it has, and it kind of leaves you with more questions than answers, but there are still a lot of important lessons that we can learn through the tragedy of what takes place in this passage, so I feel like it's still important for us to go through it. So with that in mind, we're going to look at Judges chapter 11 and begin reading at verse 29. So this is after Jephthah has tried reaching out to the king of the Ammonites to figure out why they're attacking and maybe try to come to an understanding, but the king doesn't respond. He stops uh, sending his replies and the battle continues. So with that in mind, we jump in at verse 29. It says, Then the Spirit of the Lord came on Jephthah. He crossed Gilead and Manasseh, passed through Mizpah of Gilead, and from there he advanced against the Ammonites. And Jephthah made a vow to the Lord, If you give the Ammonites into my hands, whatever comes out of the door of my house to meet me when I return in triumph from the Ammonites will be the Lord's, and I will sacrifice it as a burnt offering. Then Jephthah went over to fight the Ammonites, and the Lord gave them into his hands. He devastated twenty towns from Aroer to the vicinity of Mineth as far as abel Karamim. Thus Israel subdued Ammon. When Jephthah returned to his home in Mizpah, who should come out to meet him but his daughter, dancing to the sound of timbrels? She was an only child. Except for her, he had neither son nor daughter. When he saw her, he tore his clothes and cried, Oh no, my daughter, you have brought me down and I am devastated. I have made a vow to the Lord that I cannot break. My father, she replied, you have given your word to the Lord. Do to me just as you promised. Now that the Lord has avenged you of your enemies, the Ammonites. But grant me this one request, she said. Give me two months to roam the hills and weep with my friends, because I will never marry. You may go, he said. And he let her go for two months. She and her friends went into the hills and wept, because she would never marry. After the two months, she returned to her father, and he did to her as he had vowed. And she was a virgin. From this comes the Israelite tradition that each year the young women of Israel go out for four days to commemorate the daughter of Jephthah the Gileadite. As you can see, this passage of scripture contains something found almost nowhere else anywhere in the Bible, which is human sacrifice. And to my knowledge, there's only two other examples of human sacrifice among the Israelites that are shown. The first being Abraham, where God asks Abraham to give up his son Isaac as a sacrifice. But in that example, uh, Abraham takes Isaac up to be sacrificed, and instead God provides a ram to take the place of Isaac, so Isaac is actually not sacrificed. And that's more of God just seeing if Abraham had the faith that he would be willing to do that. And many uh, theologians believe that that was a sign of Abraham's faith because he believed that God would be able to bring Isaac back from the dead. But Isaac was never sacrificed to begin with because God provided a ram to take his place. And the only other example that I know of is with King Ahaz, who did evil in the eyes of the Lord. So this was someone who was not following God in what he did. But this example is, is different from both of those other two examples. Because we have someone who is following God, who is doing God's will, and it says that God's Spirit came upon him, and yet he makes this vow that he's going to sacrifice the first thing that comes out of his house, which would have most likely been an animal, uh, particularly, you know, if you think of how an animal wouldn't be able to get up onto the second story of a house, you know, probably wouldn't be going up the stairs. So the first floor um, oftentimes could be used for animals, and, and maybe the best well-taken-care-of animals in that household 
So that's probably what Jephthah had in mind when he made this vow to God to sacrifice the first thing that came out of his house. And yet when his daughter came out, we see that he does in fact sacrifice her to God to fulfill that vow. So let's break, th break this down a bit because this, first of all, is a tremendous tragedy. This is something that should have never taken place. And it was definitely not something that was in the will of God. And we know that, first of all, because it says that God's Spirit came upon Jephthah before he made this vow. So this was not something that God was requiring in order to give Jephthah the victory. This wasn't in God's plan, God's mind at all. Nowhere was God giving him this instruction. This was a vow that Jephthah made of his very own will after the Spirit of the Lord had already come upon him to give him the victory that he needed. So what's happening here is Jephthah is placing an unnecessary burden onto himself in order to receive victory from God. Because the Spirit was already on him, God was already going to give him the victory, and yet he goes this extra step of saying, okay, God, but if you do this, if you give me the victory, I'm going to give the first thing out of my house as a burnt offering, as a sacrifice to you. And so he's He's really going beyond what he needs to be doing in a very showy way, uh, very much just, oh, look at how great of a faith that I have that I'm not just going to accept this victory that you've given me, but I'm going to do this big grand gesture to show of how faithful I am to you so that you'll give me this victory. And it was something that he placed entirely onto himself that was completely unnecessary. He did not have to do this for God to give him the victory. He did not have to do this for God's Spirit to come upon him because it was upon him before he made this vow. And God was already planning on giving Jephthah his spirit and the victory that he needed. He had already given Jephthah that gift. And yet we have this example of Jephthah making this vow in order to take that gift from God that he had already given to Jephthah. And he didn't have to do it. But because he wanted to make this big show of his faith, he became trapped in this vow that he had made. And this teaches us an important lesson about our relationship with God, and particularly our relationship to the gifts that he gives us. You see, the gifts that God gives us are very much just that. They are gifts, and they are meant to be given, not taken. It's something that God gives us freely, that all we have to do is accept what he has already given to us. We don't have to jump through these hoops and make these big vows and claims, and all of these other things in order to receive it because God has already given it to us freely. And we need to be careful that we don't think that we somehow have to earn what God has already given to us. And, and that's been a problem all throughout history. And I can understand how it's easy to fall into that mindset because when you understand how imperfect you are, compared to God's perfection and, and God's holiness and goodness, that it makes it really difficult for us to comprehend how such a good and great and powerful and almighty God could give gifts to someone like us. But if we aren't able to accept that, then we can fall into this kind of mindset of thinking that there's more that we have to do beyond believing in him and obeying him, simply humbling ourselves and doing what he asks us to do. And we don't have to make this big show. We don't have to jump through all these hoops in order to receive from God what he's already given to us. And again, seen all throughout history, probably the most common example of that 
is the Pharisees adding extra laws to the Mosaic laws. But I think a really good example that I want to point to today is between the Jews and the Gentiles in the early church. Because a major problem that they were dealing with in the early church was that these Gentiles would accept the sacrifice that Jesus Christ had made as the price for their sin. But what was happening was that even though they were accepting that free gift of salvation, that the Jews were saying that they still had to be sacrificed, or no, not sacrificed, they still had to be circumcised in accordance to the Mosaic law in order, in order to be good believers. And this became a point of contention between the Jews and the Gentiles on whether or not they were supposed to be circumcised. And Paul, in his writing, addressed it uh, several times of saying that that was not it was not required anymore because God was looking for a circumcision of the heart rather than the outward body. But again, these Jews were were saying, well, if you really want to be a follower of God like we are, then you have to do this thing. And even though we've already received salvation, well, you've got to go this extra mile to really receive the, the full salvation of God. And, and only then will you be a true follower of Christ. And it became this, this huge issue all because they were placing extra requirements on something that was already being freely given. And again, that's exactly what's happening with Jephthah here that he already had God's spirit upon him, God was going to give him the victory, and yet he goes the extra mile of, of making this big claim, and, it, and we know that it's, it's kind of this vague, big claim, and, and really showy, because he's not even talking about what he will sacrifice, he's just saying, well, the first thing that comes out of my house, you know, whatever, whatever it is, I'm willing to sacrifice anything and everything to God. Like, look how great I am. If, if God will just give me the victory that he's clearly already going to give me. And, and it's just so unnecessary. And it's such a ridiculous show for no good reason that Jephthah is putting on in this way to almost manipulate God into giving him this victory. It's not too different from many um, prayers that people pray when they're at the lowest of their low. Oh, God, if, if you just do this for me, then I'm never going to do this again. Or, God, if you do this for me, then, then I promise I'll do this. And, and it's, it's this really manipulation of God. Because God has already fully uh, explained in Scripture what it is that he requires of us which is basically just obedience and belief. And yet we always try to add all of these extra conditions and, and extra circumstances and barter with God and, and really try to manipulate God into giving us what we want. And that is a terrible way to try to have a relationship with God. And we have to understand that we shouldn't be trying to manipulate God. We shouldn't be trying to take things from him. Because there's nothing that we can do, no act of righteousness that we could perform that could justify us before God. It's only done. We are only justified through the blood of Christ, through Jesus' sacrifice that he made for us. That's the only thing that justifies us before God. And it's because of Christ's sacrifice that the gifts of God are given to us. And those gifts are meant to be given to us, not for us to try to take them from God in ways similar to what Jephthah does here. So that's the first point that I want to make from this passage. And the other thing that I want to look at in here is the incredible character that is shown by Jephthah's daughter. That she's welcoming her father home, who has just won this victory that has been given to him by God. And his response to her is that now he has to sacrifice her because of this crazy, unnecessary vow that he has made to God. And her response 
is okay. She says, you've given your word to the Lord due to me just as you promised. And so she honors this vow that her father has made before God. And she does not want to come between her father and God. She doesn't want any kind of hesitancy or or rebuke or anything like that to diminish what God had just given to Jephthah. And so even though this is an entirely unfair situation, she had no part in the vow that Jephthah had made. It really is not fair for him to thrust this vow upon her. He should have never made this vow in the first place. And yet, despite how incredibly unfair the situation is, she handles it like a champ. She handles it in a way that I don't think any of us could have. Of this acceptance of paying the ultimate price of her life in order to honor the vow that Jephthah has made before God. An incredibly unfair circumstance, and yet she shows incredible character in the midst of it. And it really is how unfair this situation is that highlights how great the character of Jephthah's daughter is. Because really, any kind of character, is it should not be dependent upon our circumstances. It shouldn't be dependent upon our situation. And in fact, if you have a character that is dependent upon whatever situation you're in, then well, that's no character at all. Because you're willing to change your character to base whatever situation and circumstance you're in, that's not character. Character is doing the right thing when no one else is watching. Doing the right thing when the situation is totally stacked against you and completely unfair. It shouldn't matter whether everyone's watching, if everyone's going to notice the great work that you did, and it really contrasts with Jephthah's own actions in such an incredible way where Jephthah has made this huge vow in, you know, in front of everyone about what he's going to do in order to take this blessing from God, in order to take this gift of the victory. He's going to do this great thing. And he announces this, right? He makes this big vow. Whereas Jephthah's daughter is the complete opposite. Where she's saying, I know this is unfair, this isn't right, but because you've made this vow, I'm not going to be what causes you to break that vow, and I will accept this situation no matter how unfair it is. And I don't care, and whereas Jephthah's vow ultimately builds himself up, the daughter's acceptance of the vow tears her apart completely. And we have to recognize that that is what true character looks like. A character, a character that looks at a completely unfair situation and says, it doesn't matter that this is unfair towards me. This doesn't, it doesn't matter that I shouldn't be here. I shouldn't have to deal with this. None of that matters. It's not going to change what I do. And it's not going to prevent me from doing what I know to be right. And that's the kind of character that we should have. A character that says, I don't care what other people do. I don't care how other people treat me. I will never use it as an excuse to do something that I know is wrong. I'm not going to justify my actions based upon the actions of other people. And it doesn't matter if no one else is watching, I'm going to do the right thing, regardless of if I'm the only person there, if no one else ever knows about it, whether or not it's fair, none of that matters. I will always do what I know is right. And religious people in particular, people of faith, are not always seen that way 
because we haven't been great about living that way. There's a life lesson that I heard once. It's kind of a joke, really. Uh, I don't even remember who I heard it by, but it still makes me laugh every now and then. Um, but somebody told me, if you ever go fishing, never take one Mormon guy fishing with you because he will drink all your beer. Instead, take two Mormon guys and neither one of them <laughs> will touch a drop. Um, <laughs> and, and the whole point of the joke is that, you know, if you just take the one guy, he'll drink your beer because nobody else is watching. But if you take two of them, well, he's going to be caring about what the how he looks to the other person and what the other person's going to think of him, that he's not going to do that. And now that there's some sense of accountability, well, now he's going to do the right thing. And, you know, it's a funny joke, but we have to ask ourselves, is that what our faith looks like? And especially, is that what our faith looks like? To the people around us that we are supposed to be living as an example of Christ to? Do they know that we will act differently based upon the circumstances? Do we act differently among other Christians than we do around people who are not Christians? Do we act differently in church than we do in the workplace? Do we act differently when it's a group of all guys or a group of all girls than we do in mixed company. Are we consistent in the way that we act, or does it change upon the circumstances? Because if we are people of true character, if we're, if we're true followers of Christ, who teaches us what is right and what is wrong, then the words that we speak and the actions that we take should be consistent across the board, no matter what the circumstances are, no matter what the situation. Our principles, our actions, our words, our character should always be consistent, or else it is no character at all. And it's a question of, does our faith permeate every aspect of our life? or just the ones that are convenient and look the best? And that's a challenging question that we all need to ask ourselves. Is our lifestyle consistent in following the Word of God and the will of God? Now before I wrap up, there is one other part of this passage that I want us to look at. So Jephthah has made this vow. The first thing that comes out of his house will be the Lord's, and I will sacrifice it as a burnt offering. And then his daughter comes out, and she says, All right, do to me just as you promised. And she says, Give me this request. Give me two months to go uh, roam the hills and weep with my friends because I'll never marry. So her father lets her go. And then she comes back, and this is actually another testament of her character, was that she came back from those two months and she was still a virgin. I think if many of us found out that we were going to be killed in two months and we left off to go up to the hills, we probably would not be coming back a virgin, many of us. But she did. Again, another testament of her faithfulness and, and the character that she had. But what I want is... What I want to point out before we wrap up is the way that verse 39 is worded. It says, After the two months, she returned to her father, and he did to her as he had vowed. Now, the way that that is worded is kind of vague. It's, it's kind of vague phrasing there. It doesn't say, He took her, and he tied her up, and he set her on fire, and he cut her up, and any, any of those things. It doesn't go into all of those things that are involved in a burnt sacrifice. It simply says that he did to her as he had vowed. And that vague phrasing has led a few theologians to take uh, what I think is an extreme view of this, 
which is that Jephthah never actually sacrificed his daughter, and that it may have been more of something like uh, with Samuel, where he was given over to the temple to be raised in the temple and be a priest, and and really just given over to the Lord in that sense. And I think that's too big of a stretch to make with this whole thing in context. But I bring that up just to highlight how that vague phrasing really allows for a lot of different types of interpretations on what actually happened in Jephthah fulfilling this vow that he made to the Lord regarding his daughter. Now, I believe that he did, in fact, sacrifice her. But I believe that that was worded vaguely in this passage purposefully. Just like with everything in Scripture, I think everything is done the way that God wanted it to be done, and that there was meaning and purpose behind it being phrased in this way. And I think the reason why the author uses this phrasing, that he did to her as he had vowed, rather than going into details about what took place, is because, again, keep it in context of this culture and these people who all around them, there were different groups of people sacrificing people, humans, to false gods. And that is something that God did not want to happen, that God didn't want his people to emulate, and that God and this author would not want the Israelite people to continue to emulate what Jephthah did. And so in using this vague phrasing, rather than going into all the detail, it helps provide a bit of a buffer And it's kind of a preventative measure in preventing the Israelites from doing the same thing. Of saying, oh, this is a follower of God, and this is what he did to his daughter. Let's go out and do likewise. And the vague phrasing there kind of prevents that from happening as readily. And I really want to leave us with a recognition of the value in doing it this way. Because truth, without any kind of empathy, can cause further damage. By empathy, I'm talking about being able to see things from other people's perspectives. It doesn't mean that we always agree with their lifestyles, but we simply recognize the perspective that they have and the condition their heart is in. And what the author does here is he doesn't cover it up. He, d- he doesn't lie. He doesn't sweep the whole thing under the rug or say that something different happened than what actually happened. But he presents the truth in a way that is not abrasive and harmful to the target audience. He is keeping into perspective and keeping in mind how those who are reading the passage will look at it, and making sure that he is still being truthful, but doing so in a way that is not going to cause greater damage. And he's not the only author that has done this. Paul did the same thing with the people that he would talk to. There's a passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, the first couple verses that kind of highlight this. Paul writing, he says, Brothers and sisters, I could not address you as people who live by the Spirit, but as people who are still worldly, mere infants in Christ. I gave you milk, not solid food, for you were not yet ready for it. Indeed, you are still not ready. In this analogy that Paul uses in these verses, he highlights this idea of this greater truth that the audience is simply not prepared to accept yet. And so he has to start them on these small steps before he works up to something greater. And it's that same recognition, that same attitude, that I think the author in this passage of Judges is treating his readers. Of saying he, he knows that everyone around them 
participates in human sacrifices. And that it's really easy for the Israelites to adopt the practices of those around them as they worship false gods. And he knows that. And he he doesn't want to lie about what Jephthah has done. He doesn't want to cover that up. But he also does not want to promote copycats and imitators of this action that Jephthah performs. And so he gives the truth in a way that they are able to accept it without causing further damage. And I think that's a really important lesson for believers today, is is this recognition of not only what truth is and what is right and what is wrong, but also a recognition in understanding who you are talking to so that you can present the truth to them in a way that they are able to comprehend and digest. That you're not giving them so much truth and in such complex terms that you're only confusing them more or pushing them away because they think you're saying something differently than you actually are. Not only is it our responsibility to share truth with others, it's also our responsibility to share truth with them in a way that they can accept. And that does not mean that we change the truth. It doesn't mean that we compromise on what Scripture teaches and what it says. We, we don't lie. We don't twist the truth. We don't just butter it up so that um, people are more willing to accept it. That's, that's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is not going up to somebody and using terms that they don't understand and referencing all of these things that they don't have the context for and if, and leading them through your conversation to a place where they are more confused and and more irritated and rebellious against God and what his word teaches than they were before. Again, you don't have to compromise truth to do that. You simply have to be empathetic and understanding of who it is that you are talking to so that you can continue to share truth in a way that they can understand and in a way that doesn't confuse them more. And I think that's a valuable trait for us to learn from. So we have this author who is empathetic to his readers. We have this daughter who shows incredible character despite unfair circumstances and we have Jephthah who tried to make his faith too showy in a way to try to manipulate God and I think through all of these examples we're left with a a lesson that really ties this all together which is the danger of having a faith that is more outward than inward. And we don't want to have just a showy faith. What we want to have is a practical faith. A faith that understands where we are and who God is, what his word teaches, why it teaches it, and who we are talking to, and how we can implement it into our own lives. All of these things that really takes all the great truth and power of scripture and ties it into the reality of day-to-day life in practical, meaningful ways. Not just these big, broad claims of what we're going to do and what we have done and and who we are and, and all of these big things that really don't mean anything to anyone. It's just us trying to make ourselves look better. That's not the kind of faith we should have. The kind of faith that we should have is a faith that changes the way that we live on a daily basis. And it changes us not just on an outward level, but in the depths of our hearts So that no matter where we are or what kind of situation we're facing, 
whether it's fair or unfair, whether there's people watching or not, that it's consistent because it is built upon the foundation of Scripture rather than our emotions and our desire to look good for other people. And that we're not just living in a way where we're just going to do um, whatever we think is right, regardless of the people around us, but we're also taking into consideration the mission field, the people that God has placed us on this earth and, and calls us to continue to be on this earth to reach, to shine that light in the darkness, to be his ambassadors to people who don't know him, to take them into consideration as well. Is your faith practical? Does it affect your life? Or is it simply something that consists of a lot of outward things that never changes your heart? We need to have a faith that lets God change our hearts in practical, meaningful ways. And that will help us avoid unnecessary tragedies like this. So that's today's Sermon in the Pocket. As always, if you have any comments or questions for me, I'd love to hear from you. You can contact me either through the Sermon in the Pocket Facebook page, or you can also email me directly at sermoninthepocket at gmail.com. And I encourage you to share this podcast with other people, like it, rate it, all those things that help present it for other people to see. But until next time, I pray that God blesses you as you go throughout your day, and I thank you for taking the time to listen. Thank you.